What is going on guys? Hope you're doing freakishly awesome. In this video, we're taking a look at unit convolutional networks for biomedical image segmentation. So the paper is actually quite old from 2015, uh, but um, we're taking a look at it because it's one, it has been one of the most influential paper, papers in segmentation. All right, so we're just going to step through it. Uh, the focus is obviously going to be on the architecture uh, rather than for the biomedical application that they had it for, because I think I think uh, for most of us, that's not the uh, interesting or important part. But so uh, for the abstract, they're going to the, talk a little bit about the architecture, which consists of a contracting path to capture context and a symmetric expanding path that enables precise localization if that doesn't say anything to you so far, uh, don't worry, we're gonna go through, we're gonna understand the architecture. Uh, but anyways, they trained, they trained that end to end and it outperforms the previous best method, which in that time was a sliding window uh, convolutional network. All right, so um, the typical use of, of a convolutional network is on classification, right? We're used to that using sort of a ResNets and stuff like that where the idea is that we input an image and we get some, some class labels as output for, for what is actually in that image. But in many visual tasks, especially in biomedical image processing, uh, the output should include localization. And what that means is that uh, class labels is supposed to be assigned to each pixels. So if you're not familiar with semantic segmentation, actually, let me show you an example of that. All right, so if you're not familiar with semantic segmentation, this is an example of how that looks like, where at the top here we have some image, and then at the bottom we have uh, classified each pixel of that above image into some specific classes, and then we just map those classes to a particular, uh, to a particular color, and then we get this uh, right here. And so uh, they, Mentioned here that Sirison et al. I haven't read that paper, but they trained a network using a sliding window setup to predict the class label of each uh, pixel. And from my understanding, uh, how that uh, works is that sort of we have uh, an image, and then what they did is that they used a sliding window approach. So they took some particular crop, maybe like this and they wanted to classify a particular pixel of that crop. So they just want to classify a single pixel, but they took out the crop because obviously we need to have some context to what's going on. And then they ran that through a, a separate CNN. And so then they did that for every single pixel of the image. And so you can just imagine just how expensive that must be to actually run and train. Um, but one good thing, or actually we'll get to that. I don't want to get ahead of myself. And here's the architecture. We're going to skip that for now. So we'll come back to this. Um, but so uh, this network, and when they say this network, they mean that sliding windows approach. Uh, that network is able to localize. And so to find the, cl the class for a particular pixel. And then another benefit is that the training data in terms of patches is much larger than the number of training images, which is obviously a good thing, especially in these biomedical applications because it, it can be quite difficult to actually uh, find a training data. And then uh, the resulting network, it won the EM segmentation challenge so that using that sliding windows approach uh, in 2012. But, you know, they mentioned some drawbacks and, um, you know, uh, it's quite slow and that's sort of the main uh, main drawback. And so what they mention here is that in this paper, they build upon a more elegant architecture, which is a fully convolutional network. And the main idea, and actually let's now go to that figure right here. All right, here is the architecture of the paper, the unit architecture, which follows simply because it has a U-shaped. U and I'm kind of thinking of the best way to explain this, um, but sort of the overview here is that we have the output Im input image at the top left, and then uh, in the top right, we have the output segmentation map. And so the input 
first goes through um, just you know as an overview it goes through this uh, this contraction path where the input size is, is downsampled and then it has this expansive path where the image is uh, upsampled uh, and in between those this uh, contraction and, and upsampling this this contraction and expansive path they have these these skip connections and we'll go into why they have these skip connections but anyways so the input uh, here is 572 by 572 uh, and this just has a single channel and that the reason for that is because it's grayscaled and then the output in this case is 388 squared and has two channels and the reason why it has two channels is because we have you know two classes um, and one thing here to to notice is that the output is not the same as the input size and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail or they go into that in a little bit more detail in the paper but for now the reason is because they use padding uh, on the input so that's why it's larger all right so let's just follow the path so uh, they first use um, a 3x3 valid convolution which is also why the the size here is is reduced slightly uh, and you they do that two times while uh, making the number of filters to 64 and they then use downsampling so they have the the input by using a max pooling of kernel size 2 and stride 2 and then again they use that similar uh, approach as they did uh, right here from the beginning where they use two 3x3 three three comms valid, va va valid padding and then they double the number of channels so they do that again downsample a double number of channels uh, two 3x3 three three comms and they continue doing that until finally they uh, go into this expansive upsampling path so here they upsample the image using a, a transpose convolution and then so they they use these skip connections and then they sort of concatenate it along the channels dimension so we have you know half coming from the skip connection and half coming from the upsampling they use a similar approach as they did in the uh, contraction path using two 3x3 three three comms valid padding still upsample two 3x3 three three, upsample two 3x3 three three, and upsample and they also you uh, concatenate along with these skip connections for every single um, sort of uh, upsample that they do finally they they do th two 3x3 three three comms again and then finally they use a one by one comp and so that doesn't change the input size in any way but they change the the number of channels to whatever classes that they have so in this case two all right so i mean that's what they do uh, maybe we want to understand a little bit more of, of why they do that so specifically you know you can imagine um, sort of an intuitive way of doing it is that you would have some sort of image like this and that image uh, you can imagine sending that through some you know three by three um, same convolution um, and then just continue doing that a bunch of times until you finally have your output and this is a valid you know this is sort of a question why aren't we just doing it this way in this way we're preserving the input size all the time and there's sort of two main problems uh, why of doing it this way and the first problem is that um, we're not building a very large receptive field and the second is that this is very expensive so what I mean by by a receptive field is that if we imagine that we just have some some image all right and we sort of use a 3x3 three three, um, kernel 3x3 uh, three three conv and so what we're doing then is we're looking at a 3x3 three three region of that image right 3x3 three three like this where we have weights of that kernel and then we're, we're computing doing some computation and that is going to result in a single pixel in the um, after that 3x3 three three convolution and so essentially this pixel right that pixel had a 3x3 three three receptive field um, and then you can imagine that if you stack those convolutional layers the receptive field grows and grows and grows but unfortunately it doesn't grow it doesn't grow fast enough so that's sort of the the reason why we're not doing these uh, three by three same convolutions all the time 
Um, and also, that is the reason why we're doing it in this contraction path. So, I hope that was clear. Uh, why we're doing, so it's, you know, specifically what we're doing along, that was horrible. All right, so you can imagine that what we're doing along this uh, contraction path is we're learning uh, sort of what. And what I mean by that is we're learning to summarize sort of what is in the image, um, but unfortunately we're losing uh, spatial information. So we're losing sort of where those, uh, sort of where that information is. And so the, the idea is then that through this contraction path is where we figure out the where. And that is also where these skip connections comes into play and gives us that valuable information. And uh, yeah, so let's see if there was something that I missed. Oh yeah, so another thing here is that if you look at the actual sizes here, for the in the contraction path, they have 136 squared, and then they use a skip connection to something that is just 104 squared. So what they do here is that they actually crop that image right there to, to match that one. And similarly for, you know, for all of these skip connections, really, the, the sizes never match. So they have to do cropping to make them match. And, and uh, I guess a viable option is also to use padding. All right, so I hope that was a sort of a good introduction to the architecture. Let's continue with the paper. So the main idea, um, so we've kind of looked at that, but the main idea is to supplement a usual contracting network by successive layers where pooling operators are replaced by upsampling operators. Uh, and then in order to localize high resolution features from the contracting path are combined with the upsampled output. And uh, a successive convolution layer can then learn to assemble a more precise output uh, based on this information. And so you can imagine that that is sort of the perfect combination of the what and the where of the original image. So they continue in our architecture, uh, the upsampling part we have, um, the upsampling part we also have a large number of feature channels, which allow the network to propagate context information to higher re resolution layers. All right, that kind of makes sense. As a, sort of when you have more feature channels, allows it to propagate, yeah, more information I guess. As a consequence, the expansive path is more or less symmetric to the contracting path. As we saw, they're very similar, and it yields a U-shaped architecture. Uh, one thing too important to, to note here is that it doesn't use any uh, fully, fully connected layers and only uses the valid part of each convolution, uh, i.e. the segmentation map only contains the pixels for which the full context is available in the input image. Yeah, I'm not really sure what, the, what they say here, that the, it only contains the pixels for which the full context is available, but I get the first part, so they only use valid convolutions. And that's also why, uh, if we scroll up again to the architecture, we can see that the input is reduced slightly from 572 to 570 and then 568. And it continues to have that pattern just because they use these valid convolutions. Um, all right. And then they also continue to mention that this strategy allows the seamless segmentation of arbitrarily large images by an overlap tile strategy. And I'm a little bit hesitant of exactly what they mean here, but if we scroll up to this, um, this figure two right here, the strategy that they do right here is that they, they take a crop of the input image. And so you can imagine that the input image is very large and we might not be able to run that through our network. So they crop a region of that image, sort of this, this yellow part right here. And they also use padding uh, around the border. So specifically, they use a mirror padding strategy. As you can see here, the, the sort of the, these two sides are, are mirror mirrors of each other. And also at the top here, we can see that. So there, the idea is that this blue, this blue will be the input to the, uh, the, the network, which will obviously be larger than the output. And that is also why there's a mismatch. And the reason why, do, why they do it this way is from my understanding that they want the border pixels to, to have context. So, you know, if we would have removed uh, this, this padding right here, 
then obviously the borders would have no context to what's above or to the left. And so from my understanding, then they just continue doing this for different parts of the image. And then uh, sort of the output are these different crops, um, segmentation crops uh, as the result. And then they, I guess they sort of stitch that up uh, in the end to, to this full image right here. All right, and then they continue to talk about that another challenge in many cell segmentation tasks is the separation of touching objects of the same class. Um, and so I'm not too familiar with the exact uh, application that they had, but sort of they, they, they had different cells, I imagine, that, and then they sort of had issues uh, with the borders when they were actually touching each other. Um, and so what they did is that they proposed using a weighted loss where they really prioritized um, to have the borders uh, accurate. Uh, and so, yeah, and then they, they sort of continue with the network architecture. And we've already, I've already explained parts of this, but it consists of a contracting path, which is the left side and an expansive path in the right side. It consists of the repeated application of th two three by three comms, which are unpadded, each followed by a ReLU and a two by two max pooling operation with stride two, for downsampling. So at each downsampling, um, they double the number of feature channels, uh, and then that would, and you know, of course, half the input size. And I, I think this is very uh, similar, very much inspired by VGG. So every step in the expansive path consists of an upsampling of the feature map, followed by a two by two convolution, up convolution, that halves the number of feature channels and a concatenation with the correspondingly cropped feature map from the contracting path and two three by three convol convolutions, each followed by a ReLU. And they also say that the cropping is necessary due to the loss of border pixels in every convolution. Um, so we saw that previously, they, they simply don't match. You can't concatenate them without padding or cropping. So at the final layer, a one by one convolution is used to map each 64 component feature vectors to the desired number of classes. And also one thing that's important to note here is that, um, you know, to be able to do that sort of um, downsampling, uh, they, they, you need to have sort of a matching input size. So they mentioned that to allow a seamless tiling of the output segmentation map, it is important to select the input tile size such that all two by two max pooling operations are applied to a layer with an even X and Y size. So you need to kind of be careful with the exact input shapes that you choose. And so they have already done that with 577 and, and then 388 as output. All right, um, and we're kind of going to skip, we, we've kind of gone, gone through the main parts of the, of the paper in my view. But um, they also mentioned that due to the unpadded convolutions, the outpad image is smaller than the input by a constant border uh, width. And also here, um, what they did is that they, um, on the output, they used a softmax with a cross entropy loss. And so that's also why they had two channels as output. And so you can imagine that instead of doing it that way, you would have a sigmoid and just one single channel and then you would uh, use binary cross entropy instead. Uh, I'm not sure why they didn't do that, but um, but I mean it, it works just as well, I guess. All right. So in the in, in sort of the remaining part of the paper, they sort of go into some some data augmentation that they used, and they used quite a lot of data augmentation uh, because they had I get I think they had uh, 50 images or 30 images or something like that. Quite a for like a substantial, that's not a very much data. But so they go through some data augmentation and then they also go through the results, um, which is associated with this biomedical application. I don't know too much about that. So we're just gonna skip uh, those two, but you know, obviously they had good results. Uh, and so anyways, that is hopefully wasn't too fast. And hopefully, hopefully I captured my understanding of the paper. But uh, yeah, hope this was useful. Uh, thank you so much for watching the video and I hope to see you in the next paper review.